Hi everyone. Uh, this lesson, this video is designed to supplement the lesson video that I made uh, for my visit for term three. And with this uh, video, I just like to go over a few of the resources that I normally take away with me uh, when I actually visit you each term. Um, but uh, unfortunately, I can't do that uh, this year. So I'll just go through a couple of the resources that I normally uh, show you. Unfortunately, you can't touch them, but uh, this is the next best thing. So the first thing I want to go over is punching shear. Now, this is the sheet that I've actually given you to work out punching shear. The two major questions on punching shear is, first of all, the finding the force required to punch the hole. And so this uh, question here asks you to find the force required to punch that hole, given that the shear strength of the plate is 222.8 megapascals, and it's a 510 hole. And so the two things that I want to show you, first of all, is how to work out the force required to punch through this 10 millimeter plate um, and secondly i'd like to show you how to work out the compressive stress in the punch once you've worked out the force required to punch the hole and these are the two things that i want to demonstrate the area of shear when you're actually punching is pi d times thickness so it's the perimeter of the hole multiplied by the thickness and I'll show you that in a moment but when you've found the force required to punch the hole you've got to find the compressive stress in the punch so it doesn't exceed the compressive strength of the material and so you use a different area you use the cross-sectional area which is pi r squared so I'll just show you that now and I can't I normally don't take steel punches away because they're too heavy so I've made this uh, punch out of custom wood and so you can see that that is the punch and we're punching a circular hole here uh, normally you've got relief at the back here so you don't get pick up on the punch uh, as it goes through the metal and so the cutting surface is this perimeter around here and that's generally concave to give that a sharp edge so when the punch is forced through the metal this is what happens you get the waste coming out the piece of waste down the bottom and the shear area is this area here it's the perimeter of the hole and it can be a square hole it can be any shape hole so it's the perimeter now for this circular hole the perimeter is pi d and times the thickness so this rectangle represents the shear area and that's why when you're working out the force required to punch the hole because you have to work that out because you've got to figure out what sort of air cylinder or hydraulic cylinder you need to punch the punch through the metal. And so the area of shear, once again, is pi d times thickness. And so that's why we've used pi d times thickness here. Make sure you multiply by 10 to the minus 6 to bring it to meters squared. So we've found that 70 kilonewtons is the force required to punch through a 10 millimeter thick piece of metal uh, uh, and a 10 millimeter diameter punch using 222.8 megapascal shear strength of this material. Now, once you've found that, if you're applying a 70 kilonewton force, which is equivalent to about seven tons, to this punch, you've got to work out whether the compressive stress in the punch will be greater or less than the strength, the compressive strength of the punch. If, it's, if you work out the compressive stress in the punch is greater than the strength of the metal, of course it's going to fail. And so that's why you've got to use 
pi r squared for this particular one because it's circular um, and you'll have to work out the cross-sectional area of any shape and don't forget to multiply it by 10 to the minus 6 if, you, if this is in millimetres to bring it to metres squared. And so you work out that the compressive stress in the punch is 891.2 megapascals. Now, if you look up the tables and see that the strength of the material is less than that, the punch will fail. So that's punching shear. So make sure that you remember that there are two areas that you've got to use. The first one when you're finding the force required is perimeter times thickness and the stress in the punch, which is the second one, is the cross-sectional area. So let's have a look at punching shear, how it's applied to making a spoon. Now this is a normal sort of spoon that you all use. You can see that it's uh, been made from a high quality steel. It's been made from austenitic stainless steel. The, uh, it's been made from 188, which uh, is 18% chrome and 8% nickel. And it's a, a, a common alloy that's used for cutlery. So this is how it's made. The first thing they do is they shear off this shape from flat stainless steel metal. And if you have a look at it close up, you can see that the first part of the cut is quite shiny. And that's where the punch has forced its way in. And I don't know whether you can see that, that top surface has got a little radius on it, but this bottom surface is quite sharp. And so when the punch exceeds the shear strength of the metal, you can see that this part here is uh, reasonably rough compared to that top part. And that's where the shear has occurred, where when the punch has exceeded the shear strength of this stainless steel. So that's the first thing they do. The next thing is that they flatten the end and you can see that it's gone from that shape to that shape and a tremendous amount of coal working has occurred. And then after they do that, they shear this surface off and this is scrap, that part there is scrap and that is recycled. But because of the massive amount of coal working that's been done on this, they have to process and kneel it because if you went from that to cupping out the end there, it would fail because of the extreme work hardening. And this uh, has to be annealed and it's process annealed. Uh, and you can see the temper colors on it. Then the next thing that happens is that the end of it is rounded and uh, this has been process annealed, as I said, but the temper colors, which show uh, the change in oxide color with the different temperatures, uh, um, have been buffed off. And then finally, it's been pressed into the shape of a spoon. So that's uh, basically what punching shear is all about. Next thing I want to show you is a seal the, that I normally bring away, is a seal that's used in hydraulic systems. And you can see this is uh, the exercise that I gave you during the visit lesson. Um, and you can see that this is a bottle jack here and you have to have seals to prevent the hydraulic fluid from seeping out. So this is a schematic drawing of it. And so you've got a seal at the top and a seal on the, on the top of the input piston. That's the ram or the output piston. And this is the input piston. And the idea is that the high pressure on this hydraulic fluid will force the seal by a servoing action against the outer side of the barrel. And the higher the pressure here, 
the higher the sealing rate is on the actual seal. And so this is a seal here. Uh, this is an old seal. You can see that the properties of the seal would be uh, flexibility. You can see that it's quite flexible. This is uh, polyurethane and uh, it uh, should be able to resist a high tensile and compressive force uh, and it should obviously resist the action of hydraulic fluid but if I bring it up closer you can see that you've got a tapered recess all the way around the outside so that when the hydraulic fluid is pushed into that recess because it's tapered it forces the outside up against the inside of the hydraulic cylinder so the higher the pressure in here the higher the force pushing this outer part of the seal onto the cylinder walls and uh, that's how you get a excellent seal. Now, this one has to be replaced because you can see that uh, there was some pickup on the edge of that seal there. And, uh, and it's a quite a, a significant job replacing these. So what the operators do, they just pull the whole ram off and uh, get a replacement um, ram. Okay, so that's a hydraulic seal and uh, it uh, has the properties of a hydraulic seal, has to, be, has to be flexible, it has to resist hydraulic fluid, it has to have a high tensile and compressive strength and also it should have a low coefficient of friction when it is moving against the inner wall of the barrel of the hydraulic cylinder. Next thing I want to show you is uh, a little bit on prosthesis. So I'm, I've got a hip prosthesis that I'm going to show you and this is how it works and I'll explain where they go. So this part here is the part that actually goes into the femur um, and the part at the top is the socket, which uh, fits up there on the hip replacement. So I just want to explain a couple of things with these uh, prostheses. So this is a cobalt chrome prosthesis. Um, cobalt is a bit of a problem because when you have the ball reacting if it's a cobalt ball and you've got a socket that's made of cobalt as well, you get the debris with the, the ball moving in the socket. Uh, obviously, this isn't cobalt socket and that's not a cobalt ball, but I'll explain that in a moment. Uh, you get debris occurring and it can get into your bloodstream and it can poison some people. So generally, the uh, setup that they use now is this setup that I'll explain uh, now. Um, and they used to actually cement the stem into the bone, but uh, they roughen up. The idea now is that they roughen up the surface. Uh, they, if it's a titanium alloy, the general titanium alloy is 6% aluminium and 4% vanadium. And... Uh, it, there would, they would rather the bone grow into the roughness um, of the titanium surface than use cement, and uh, not very many people use bone cement now. So this is the stem, and uh, it, these are quite expensive. I think this uh, one was about $5,000. And this is an important part of the new sorts of hip prosthesis is this ball. This ball is made of, from ceramic and you can see how it slots on there and it's called a Morse taper so that you don't need any mechanical attachments to put that ball on. Because it's in compression, if you force the 
two parts together on a Morse taper, it locks in place. And because the taper is at the exact angle, it, it takes a lot of effort to actually break that bond there. And so they've used a Morse taper. If the taper was any shallower, you wouldn't get it off. It would lock in. But if it was any bigger, it wouldn't lock at all. And they use Morse tapers to hold ferrules into the uh, tailstock of lathes or drill some ch uh, chucks into the uh, mandrel head of a vertical drill. So Morse tapers are significant with hip joints. And as I said, uh, the force on this will be in compression and so it will lock in and it will never move. <clears throat> so this uh, ball has been made from a ceramic and it is a um, hard material. It's, it has a high compressive strength. It's um, very smooth, low coefficient of friction and it will resist, uh, as I said, compressive forces. And because it's hard, you won't get any debris or very much debris washing off it as a result of movement in this socket. Now, this socket here that I've got, I've uh, sectioned it to show you how thick the socket is. Um, this is made from high molecular weight um, cross-linked polyethylene and uh, it has a low coefficient of friction, high compressive strength. Um, it is biocompatible. Uh, obviously, all of these materials, the significant property of all these materials um, is that it, they have to be biocompatible. And uh, it uh, has a low coefficient of friction when you use it with a ceramic ball. And uh, on the outside here, this is a titanium socket and they ream out the bone and then they uh, force the socket into the hole. Sometimes they actually, here's another socket, sometimes they actually screw the socket uh, into the bone using those two holes there. And notice that you've got uh, stainless steel wire around the outside of this one to stop the socket from actually spreading uh, with the compressive load. Um, so that's, uh, that's the socket and uh, this is a knee joint. This is a chrome cobalt knee joint. You can see that the inside of it has been roughened up so that the bone can grow into it. And you've got two dowels there to locate it uh, into the bone. And you've got uh, high density, high molecular weight, cross-linked polyethylene as a rubbing surface there. And, uh, and then this part here, this is a titanium part. See how they've strengthened it up with the with the ribbing on it like that. And you've got the perforated uh, surface there for the bone to grow into it. And so that's how these knee prostheses actually work. They slide over one another. And the latest... Um, prosthesis, a hip prosthesis, is ceramic on a ceramic socket. And uh, when you have ceramic on ceramic, you get very few uh, debris particles going into the, the bloodstream. And the only problem with ceramic on ceramic is that the odd time, because they misalign sometimes, they squeak a little bit and you can see uh, something on YouTube on um, the squeaking ceramic on ceramic prostheses. Okay, so that's uh, a quick summary of uh, the resources that I generally take away with me during term three, year 11 uh, visits. So thanks for listening. Bye.